Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Hope you're having a good Tuesday. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi down here in Walterboro, day 17 of the Alec, Alec, my Southern came out, Alec Murdoch double murder trial. It's been another interesting day in court. Last few days have, yesterday and today have been, uh, there's been no lack of, of, uh, excitement, I guess you could say. I, I don't know if you could call it excitement in the courtroom. It's just been a little bit different. Few, few things coming up that, you know, we're getting to the end of the case. Things are getting interesting. So before we get started, music fact of the day, love shack. Cause it's Valentine's day. Happy Valentine's day. Y'all. I don't care about Valentine's day. Tell me you love me like in October, right? Uh, anyways, those of you that are celebrating very, very happy Valentine's day to you. Uh, but the song Love Shack, I thought was very appropriate. Just read an interview last night with the B-52s. And so the song Love Shack, everybody asks me all the time because I'm kind of like the person to go to for lyrics. What does tin roof rusted mean? Well, I know the Urban Dictionary says it's an unplanned pregnancy, but that's not what they meant in this song. So she explains that when they were recording this, she just had this vision in her head of this shack that's just kind of outside Athens, Georgia. It's closed down, but it's got this tin roof that's rusted. And she said, I was just using that image in my head when we're jamming. And so they're singing and they're, they're just belting the song out. And then the tape ran out. So she just keeps going and she just yells tin roof rusted into the mic and they kept it in the song. So there you go. Now, you know, all right. Day 17. If you remember yesterday, the pathologist was uh, on direct and they finished up at the end of the day. And so the defense said it would take about an hour to cross examine. So they waited till today. So that's where we started out this morning. The jury looked a little tired this morning. Yesterday was such a, I think a traumatic day almost for some of the jury members, uh, a couple in particular. And so Harputlian tells them that he's sorry, they're going to have to look at more graphic photos today visibly one of the jurors was just like no i can't do this can't do this and it's you know it's hard if you think about it these are people who chose not to go into crime scene investigations or forensics because they probably don't want to see this stuff on a regular basis and then we pluck them out of the community and make them look at it on a big screen and it's not a movie these are real human beings and i, I think it's i think it's a lot you know that can stick with these people so i hope that they're taking care of themselves when they go home. This is heavy stuff, you know? So they talk about Maggie first. Now I was able to get my pictures up. And so here are the wounds to Maggie. And you can see that one just kind of on the very lower back. You see the one that goes through that left breast up into uh, the face and the head and then the thigh shots. So talking about Maggie he asks if she was shown the photos of the back of her leg that were taken at the scene. And she said, no. So he shows her a photo of Maggie's calf. Remember there was a little bit of speculation that maybe that was a footwear impression in dirt on the back of her calf. And defense says, you know, an autopsy, you noted a bruise in that spot. And the witness says, no, I don't think I remarked about a bruise. And I didn't observe that during autopsy. He asked if the body had been washed and she said, no, but it could have just you know, fallen off during transport if it's dirt. So then he asks, was the shot consistent with someone circling her, which is such a haunting image to me just to even think about it. You know, she's already been shot. She's down, she's in pain. And just the, even the thought of somebody circling her is just, oh man. Um, but so the witness says she was shot behind and above and she could, she could have been moving until that first headshot came that would have rendered her unconscious. And the fence says, we know the shooter was moving. Did she have soot? And the witness said she had stippling, not soot. So she said, based on the autopsy, it's a reasonable explanation that she could have been turning around after getting shot. And so with when you have stippling, that means that the shooter was three feet away, like three to four feet at most. And 
Harputlian points out, it doesn't mean the shooter was three to four feet away, the muzzle, the very end of the gun was. And she said, that's correct. So Harputlian asked, why did you say that that shot to the pancreas and the kidney was painful? I don't think Harputlian's had a kidney stone. Um, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but I had a kidney stone and I was on the ground. This is right after I had my son. And I thought it was way worse than being in labor and having him. And I can't imagine the pain she felt after being shot and it went straight through her kidney because it didn't kill her and our bodies feel pain. So she said in response to why did you say that was, that was painful? Well, she said, because the subsequent shot was going upward and into her head. So it's hard to think she wasn't bent over. Remember yesterday, she said she might've had her hand on her stomach, kind of bent over in pain. Then he, she talks about uh, crime scene photos. She doesn't typically look at them. She just kind of does her autopsy without reference to the scene at all. And so we move on to Paul. And so here are his wounds. I have a link. I will have a link in the description for these photos. If you're only listening, if you're on YouTube, you can see these now. So we see Paul was shot twice in the chest and then uh, that one in the top of the shoulder that, that traveled into the neck and then came out the back of his skull. And so the first shot was to the chest with buckshot. And she says, yes. And then the defense says it, after that first shot, he's upright. Would he be turned diagonally? And was that a contact wound? And she said, no, this was shot at an angle across and he could have been perpendicular or the shooter could have been to his side. And so the defense asked, you feel confident that his arm was down? And she said, with the bruising and a short exit wound and bruising on the underarm, that tells her that the arm was down. Now, what's a short exit wound? It means that the bullet is stopped by something. So the momentum stops. And then it gives this jagged, torn appearance on the skin when it hits something that stops that momentum. It's, it's just very different looking than than just an entry and exit wound where there's nothing blocking the energy of that, that projectile. Um, she also said that the pellets exited and then re-entered into his body. The defense says either the shooter is to his right shooting across. And then he said, and you think the shooter is close, close to three feet away. And she said, yes, um, to the right of Paul or Paul turned. So the defense asked if there were footprints in the feed room, would that indicate possibly he stepped in his own blood? And she said, yes. So they bring out somebody from the defense to kind of demonstrate these, the angle of these wounds. So you can see here in this photo, she's showing after it goes through the shoulder, it enters there in the neck, just about half an inch below that bottom earlobe is kind of what I'm guesstimating, but y'all know me and math, we ain't friends. So it's just below that earlobe. Then the defense asks about Paul's height. I, you know, I, I really think maybe what's going to happen is because also right as uh, lunch was ending, but before the judge was back on the bench, they measured Alec, like got a tape measure. So I'm wondering, he's asking about Paul's height. They're measuring Alec. Is their witness, their expert witness going to try to, estimate the height of the shooter based on the trajectory of the bullets and that kind of stuff. I really hope that that's something that the state does tomorrow. They're supposed to wrap it up, but now we got other issues and I don't know, we'll talk about it at the very end because that's when it came. So hopefully they still finish tomorrow. We need to keep this rolling. We got COVID everywhere. Y'all look, anybody that calls in that courtroom gets the stink eye. Just saying. Also, the jury will be tested again tomorrow for COVID. Fingers crossed nobody has it because I do think if anybody else gets it, we're going to maybe have a little break in these proceedings. He talks about how narrow that feed room is. We've seen photos of it. It's very small. It's cluttered. So he mentions the buckshot goes through that back window and asks if that is consistent with her findings. And she says yes. So they talk about beveling. And so that's when there's a gunshot wound and a hole. She can tell the entrance and exit without looking at the skin. She can tell what's an entrance and what's an exit wound. So with beveling, there it's, it's shot at an angle. And sometimes they call it, I think, like a keyhole wound. We need Joseph Scott Morgan on here right now. But it lets you know that that, that came in at an angle and not straight. So 
the defense says the bevel inward on entrance. So when somebody is shot, you have this round hole to see entrance, and that's pretty typical. That's what you see, and you don't see the damage to the, the bone. It goes inward, but that exit wound, it comes out. So Harputlian's talking about the bevel is inward on the entrance wound and then outward on an exit. When it exits, you have a, a narrow bevel on the inside more than the outside, and she said yes. So the defense says the second shot, that would be the one that started in the shoulder, also, let's go ahead and look at this, the progression of these pictures. So you have this first entrance here. And then she's again showing with her finger, you know, about where that went in. And then it traveled upward, you know, as we know, unfortunately. And uh, a lot of that back skull was, was gone. So there was no stippling, which means that the into the barrel was more than three feet away. So then he's asking if Paul's chin was bent. And she said, if he's tilted and she kind of puts the witness's chin down to his chest, if he's completely turned, it would have went into his face, but it, his face apparently was spared from damage and he had it turned, but just not, not all the way. So they show some x-rays and the left arm, we see these little dots, which are shotgun pellets. She counts out 20. And so the pellets begin at the soft tissue of the shoulder. And then the upper right corner of Paul's chest shows a significant number of pellets. And then she shows the entrance wound and then how those pellets spread once that projectiles entered the body is uh, man that's just look i've seen a contact shotgun wound up close a double homicide um with with soot and i'm gonna tell you right now there was nothing left of their heads essentially it was it was very traumatic to see and i don't say that lightly things don't bother me i, I could never walk into a crime scene and do that but like i can look at crime scene photos or see a body in the morgue and it doesn't bother me. I, I was working on the donor team, by the way, taking corneas out for transplant. I wasn't just hanging out in there. Um, very sad place to be because if you're in the morgue, there's questions for the most part. So um, so you, they're, they're just looking at all these pellets. And then the defense asked if she removed all those shotgun pellets from his body. And she said, not, not all of them. She said, you can fish for an hour for one pellet in soft tissue. And essentially she gets enough that she thinks law enforcement needs. And then, you know, she doesn't have to get every pellet out. So they talk about on the x-ray, is it buckshot? She said she didn't think it was buckshot, but they all look kind of similar to her. So then they show another x-ray of the lower left and she points out that you can see his upper and lower teeth. There were no fractures to the upper or lower teeth. And again, that just goes back to the angle it went in. This was all spared. And so the defense asked, you know, did you see an exit wound? And she said, yes. And the defense says his skull exploded, basically. She said a piece of his skull was missing. It's difficult to identify the exit wound with the amount of damage he had, but it I mean, it seems clear that it came out on that top right side um, just because the the whole, I mean, it, it essentially blew the back part of his skull off. And trigger warning, I should have done this at the very beginning. This does talk about very graphic stuff. A little too late. Sorry, but I, I try to do trigger warnings, but yeah, I'm a little late on that. So she is explaining about the two defects. And she said, I think the head was angled for the continuation I don't think it was going upward. It was, you know, if his head is bent, it's going to go upward. So, you know, she just thinks it was angled. And that continuation happened from the shoulder. I think it was the clavicle neck. And then it missed the brainstem apparently also. So they, the defense turns the head of the defense attorney more and asks if it's possible that Paul's head was bent to the side more. And she said, you know, she still just kind of stands by what she says, which is based on where it went and the continuation of the bullet that 
his head was angled. So the defense puts a ruler on the top of the head of the defense guy. And if you can't see, it's about an inch or two just above my forehead and points out basically his skull exploded and all of this is missing, which is about two inches above my hairline, all that back. And so he says it's gone. And the witness says on the right side, so essentially there must have been some of the back skull left, but it seems like that right side of the skull was, was completely gone from the exit wound. And so he brings out this book on gunshot wounds and I really don't know where he was going with this. He talks about gas clouds and how there's energy with those. So there's a contact wound photo that he shows her from this book. And she says, look, this is depicting a contact wound. So the pellets wouldn't have been released yet. And the defense points out there's a lot of destruction to her head. I mean, to Paul's head. And again, the witness says this author is discussing contact wounds and Paul's damage was kind of similar, but it's not a contact wound. So then the defense talks about gas entering the chamber of the head from that projectile. And it expands rapidly. And the only way for the gas to exit is essentially to shatter the skull. And so she, um, if he asked if the muzzle is three to four feet away, would gas enter the body? And she said, it's a huge amount of energy entering if he's not there with a contact wound, even without a contact wound, it's a lot of energy coming in with that shotgun shell. And she said, I don't know if it's gas that causes the destruction of, of the skull, but she said a shotgun wound from far away would cause extensive damage nonetheless. And she said, I don't know if gas is responsible for the damage from a few feet away. And again, she mentions this author is talking about a contact wound. Very different. Um, when I worked in the morgue, it, it, yeah, it's, it's very different. There was nothing there when I saw the two men that had been murdered, nothing of their face. And that was a contact wound they had, uh, soot on them. The defense, he's, he, Harputlian is still going on about gas causing this head wound. So he talks about the number of autopsies she's done. And, you know, did you see contact wounds by shotgun? And she said, yes. Um, she said, Paul had a lot of his head still there and it was a horrible destruction of his skull. But his face was intact, and she didn't see any evidence of contact with that shotgun. The defense says the energy went through the shoulder, the neck, and the head with a fracture at the base of the skull, and that can push the brain out. We know yesterday it was said it was ejected from his, his skull cavity. And then the defense points out that his brain was brought essentially in a bucket to the autopsy separate from his body. And she said, yes, but not his brainstem. So it sounds like his brainstem was still intact. So Harputlia mentions uh, the state didn't show any crime scene photos. And she said, I don't look at them. Um, she said she did see some thumbnail sizes a couple of weeks before trial started. And so we get into some x-rays. As that bullet goes forward, it expands, even if it hits something. And so you have that wadding. That's what it's called, wadding. And that ended up in the armpit area. And then the, there was some more wadding found on the floor, I believe. But she said the entrance wasn't straight or he would have had a smaller hole entrance hole. You know, you see a gunshot wound, you got the, the small hole and then you've got your exit wound, which is usually a lot bigger. She talks about as it goes across the left shoulder, we get more of an oblong wound, meaning it's not that regular round entrance. It came in at an angle and it, it, it made that entrance wound look different than it normally would. She talks about the, the continuation of that bullet going through the neck and then going through the head, just destroying everything. There were no pellets in his face. The defense asked, as that bullet continues, any evidence it expanded more? And she said, there's so much destruction to the skull. It exited with energy. He asked, what would you expect to see on the back of a head if it was a contact gunshot wound to the head? And she said the brain would not have come out, which I thought was interesting. Um, you know, it essentially sounds like it came out pretty much whole. And so Harputlian apologizes to the jury and shows a photo. I believe this was a crime scene photo. Remember, we can't see the graphic photos, but she hasn't seen that photo. And they're talking about a semicircle defect in his skull. And can you tell if there's any beveling? 
And she said, it's not too reliable with so much destruction. Now, beveling is when we need Joseph Scott on here. But my understanding is like it, it can look like a keyhole. The wound, the entrance or the exit wound can look like a keyhole. The entrance wound, I believe. And it's because it comes in at an angle. It's not like a straight in. It kind of comes in, you know, at an angle. Like I just said, Lord have mercy, y'all. Me and guns. We, mm, I, I'm not, I, I don't know about all this stuff. <laughs> You'd see soot if it was a contact wound, ultimately, is what she's saying. And he asked if she took any photos of this part of the skull, and she said no. And then he asked, did you shave Paul's head? And she says no. So the defense points out, but you shave Maggie's. And she said, I felt that my assessment was correct. It was an exit wound, the big wound at the back of Paul's head. And she said, I don't shave those. Um, Maggie's, what she shaved was an entrance wound. The defense says to observe marks on the skin, you need to shave the head. And the witness says there, there would have been soot. In other words, I don't, I'm not sure why we're trying to argue. This might've been a contact wound. I, I just can't help but think he's setting up his expert witness for something else. But ultimately he says people can disagree. And she says people can, but it doesn't change the truth. He asks, you never look for stippling or soot. And she said, I would have documented it if I would have seen it. You didn't shave his head to get a better look. She says, essentially, I didn't need to. You're extending the author's statement. He's kind of relying on, on this book. And she's saying, this isn't a contact wound. The brain would not have been ejected from his skull. And we would have had fractures in the face. The brain was left intact. No path through the brain. So her opinion that that big defect in the back of the skull was not the entrance wound. Contact would have made massive damage to the head and the face. There wouldn't have been really anything left. I mean, that's what I observed when I saw the two men. Um, there just wasn't much left. And parts of them came in separate separate bags. I mean, it's just how bad it was. There really wasn't much of a, of a head left. So she said she concluded the entrance wound based on the distribution of those pellets. And she said, I see this at autopsy keeps asking about a contact wound. So she explains the different damage you'll see if it's contact wound versus what she expects it to be about three feet away. And so the chest shot, the defense talks about that. It comes out under his arm and she says, yeah, and we have a pattern of pellets, which shows that it came in and then expanded. Those pellets come out as soon as it hits. Then he asks her how many pellets are in a shotgun shell. She's like, I don't know. And he said, you don't know how many pellets. And she's like, nope. So redirect, you know, your job. So this is Creighton Waters, by the way, for the state. It's not your job to look at crime scene photos. And she said that's not incorporated into her conclusion. She relies on what she sees at autopsy. Crime scene pretty much, she says, is irrelevant to her as far as what she determines to be the cause and manner of death and, and the order of everything, how things came. They mention you saw stippling on the chest wound and she said stippling is, you know, gunpowder deposits on the skin two to three feet from the barrel. Soot is burn marks from gunpowder. It's not seen often past six inches. So if you're more than six inches away, you're not going to see the soot. It's got to be a contact. I mean, right there. Just And, and it was different. It wasn't documented during autopsy. She said, I know the chest wound is at least three feet. But essentially, the prosecutor, no soot on Paul, no. He reiterates, she's done over 5,500 autopsies over 20 plus years. They mentioned the book about the contact wound and she says, yes. And, and so the prosecutor says no evidence of a contact wound. She says, no, um, frequently contact wounds can indicate suicide. So any evidence, this could be a suicide. She says, no. And the head wound, you were asked about the possibility of this being a contact wound and she, she said there's no soot and didn't see evidence that the shot was going to the top of his head with his head down. And she said, no. And while examining the brain, there was also no evidence. It came from the top. She said the, the shoulder angle, the wound that eventually went through his head, it was a tangential type. So that was kind of it. So we did, uh, you know, recross. You didn't see the crime scene photos. Nope. That answer hadn't changed from the first time you asked me five minutes ago. <laughs> Cracks me up sometimes. Then Harputlian asked to see crime scene photos help you or would seeing crime scene photos help you. And she said, no, I examined the body. If I see something unusual, I might ask, but you know, I don't need to see photos. Whatever's on the body is what I use to make my conclusion. 
the defense asked, did you talk to Sled about bruising on Maggie's calf? And she said, I didn't see that at autopsy. So we go to break. We have a quick witness, uh, Evan Newell, who is a senior tech expert for OnStar General Motors. We know that now they have gotten um, some, some new data from the night of the murders from the Suburban, some location data. And so they, it, he just set it up for whoever's going to testify about this. Let's send a search warrant for information on that Suburban. And last Friday on the 10th, they had that information available. Somebody's watching the trial and was like, dude, they just said, we don't, we don't answer to subpoenas or search warrants and we better get on it. Cause it's a big old trial, right? You don't want to get that bad of a name. So lo and behold, Friday, we got your stuff better late than never. Right. They've gathered some information over the last few days. It was a uh, vehicle diagnostics, battery information, and GPS. So on Cross, you're not part of the search warrant team. Nope. Uh, GM's legal staff actually contacted him on Friday to come verify these records. That's why he's here. So he knew that the FBI had worked on what they had been able to get from the Suburban but um, he wasn't aware that they reverse engineered it. Remember, they had to sort of get an identical model and try to figure out how to get the data off and that kind of thing. So it was really just um, super, super quick. What you know, Alec Byers, you know I've been traveling weekly to cover the Alec Murdoch murder trial. And I hate packing. And even more, I hate loading and unloading a bunch of bags when I get back to Walterboro. The Weekender bag from base has cut down the number of bags I need to take and has all the things I need, like a laptop sleeve and even a key leash. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has thought of everything you could ever want in a piece of luggage. 360 degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep organized. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors, and for shorter trips, the Weekender bag is super functional and even has a place to store your shoes separately. Every piece is made to look better with miles, so you don't have to worry about it in cargo or overhead. And Base has over 30,000 five-star reviews. Whether you're packing for a quick trip or looking to breeze through the security line, Base has your personal items covered. Right now, Base is offering my listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash what the world. Go to basetravel.com slash what the world for 15% off your first purchase. That's Base, B E I S travel.com slash what the world. And now it's time for a word for our sponsor of the week, Lomi by Pila. Look, I've never been able to compost before. It's always too complicated, too much work, and it's too stinky. Then I got a Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter that turns scraps into dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's really quiet. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week, down from four bags to two, by the way, and I feel great knowing I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. I have basically a limitless supply of dirt for my garden. So what can you put in Lomi? Food leftovers, fruits and vegetables, eggs and eggshells, grains, coffee grounds, yard trimmings, house plants, and more. If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use the promo code what the world to get your $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use promo code what the world at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. Next is, I'm going to tell you right now. I love this guy. And if you live in the South, you know, 50 like him, laid back, simple life, does what he's got to do, and then gets in his recliner after a shower. This is Roger Dale Davis Jr., who helped out on the farm a little bit with the animals. So uh, Alex stopped one day and asked him about helping with the kennels. So that was about four years ago. So he would go in the morning around 7, and then he would go between 3.30 and uh, 4 o'clock. So Overall, his job at the kennels took about 45 minutes each time. In the morning, feed the dogs, feed the chickens, wash the pens out. In the afternoon, repeat. Uh, so 
he puts all names on this diagram that has all the kennels and shows where the dog should be in each kennel. So he explains to wash out, you spray with water. He puts the beds on top of their little kennels so they don't get wet. And in the four years, he talks about he's gotten to know the property and the family very well. He said, Maggie was laid back and talked to me like a normal person. And I thought that was really cool. Finally, today, we had a voice for Maggie in that courtroom. And I, I don't say she hasn't had a voice. Buster's there. And, you know, I feel like uh, that that even Alex family, you know, is, is a voice for Maggie, too. They're, look, y'all, I'm very empathetic. And I feel like they're caught between a rock and a hard place right now. They're supporting Alec. Families do that. At the same time, they've suffered major losses with Maggie and Paul and don't want to be in their shoes. But I, I thought that was really sweet today because Maggie's sister and brother-in-law got on the stand. And it was, um, yeah, it was nice to have somebody there because I kind of felt like Maggie at sometimes has gotten lost in this trial. It was nice to, to hear all about her today. She loved the dog. She loved the beach. Uh, sometimes she would take the dogs with her to the Edisto house. And Sometimes he said, if it was really, really hot, it's the South y'all in the summer, low country upstate, don't matter where you at, it is sticky and hot. She would have them put the dogs in what they call the ice house, which was a processing house that had air conditioning. So I thought that, you know, anybody who has dogs and loves them, you're going to make sure they're okay. Don't leave your pets out in the cold or the heat y'all, or find somebody who will take care of them. That grinds my gears y'all. I've stopped before. I'm lucky I haven't gotten shot. He would talk about how he would stretch the hose out. Okay, so we say hose pipe in the South, right? Garden hose, whatever you call it. We call it hose, right? The hose was at the far end of the kennels. And so he would have to turn off one valve and then he would have to turn on another valve to get it to work. And he was very particular about how this hose was put up. It would kink up and the hose would get splits in them and it's just a pain. And what they're relating this to is there was a photo shown of the crime scene. Uh, you didn't see any bodies, but you see that the, the hose is put up and it's not like he would have left it that day. He said he knew Paul, who was a little wild and crazy, but he said that boy liked to work. He would hunt whatever his dad needed him to do, he would do. He identifies Alec in in the courtroom, says he was a little particular. Um, he wanted the dog buckets washed out daily, and he said he was hard to get a hold of. He saw Maggie and Paul most often. and. Paul was either in a white F-150 or F-250. If Alec had him doing something, he would be in that F-250. It sounds like that F-150 was what he mainly drove. And so he names off all the dogs they had. It was Grady, Bubba, Maggie, Armadillo. I'm missing a couple of names. He says that uh, Bubba was rambunctious. Maggie would let the dogs come to the house the main house, he said that she had beds all over the porch. He The dogs weren't allowed in due to an, an allergy that Buster had. Poor Buster, man. They're just telling everybody what allergies he's got and all that. Then she would load him in the car if she was going to take him to Edisto. They show the, the photos of the kennel. He points out that that hose is not up like he would have left it earlier in that day because he was there earlier in that day. Day, nothing unusual. Got there at the same time he normally does around 7. Did the same in the afternoon. Before 4 o'clock, he said he left at 4.30. Nobody was there. Nothing was out of place. And he fed the animals, washed the pins out, stretched the hose, turned the valves on, rolled the hose up, left at 4.30. So he talks about when he left, which kennels the dogs were in. On the 8th, the next morning, he gets a call from C.B. Rowe, who's the groundskeeper there at Moselle. And C.B. told him that Paul and Maggie had been murdered. He thought it was a joke. Uh, but CB said, no, and Sled wants to talk to you. So when he goes to talk to Sled, the dogs are going nuts, probably because they're seeing him. They're, they, look, y'all, you can't tell me these dogs didn't get traumatized by what they see. I I had a dog for 20 years, and when my kids were sick, she would sit up all night. She knew something was wrong. I think dogs feel this stuff. Just we need those little collars, you know, like an up where they can talk. It would make things so much easier, wouldn't it? But these poor puppies. So when he got there, the dogs were barking bad. So he asked if he could just feed them and he did and they calmed down. Then we are looking at a kind of a like a like a side view of the kennels looking straight. So we're looking as if we're standing at the very end looking straight down and you got all the kennels on your left. And he said in four years of washing kennels did the water pool 
And he said under the hose, armadillos, pins. And then um, he talked about some rot. I couldn't hear where he said, but it sounds like maybe there was a door that wasn't sealed. And then like the door stopper or something would was starting to rot. So you had to be really careful. And then he was asked if water pooled by the feed room. And he said no. And water also did not pool near Bubba or Grady. Their pens. And then so they show the picture of the water in the feed room. He said that's not how it pooled when he washed them out for four years. He said there's too much water in those kennels. But here's the thing. I think in, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Maggie had certain pens that the dogs were to be put in. And so they switch over to talking about guns. Paul favorited his his blackout rifle. He took it hog hunting. He knew that. And he also knew about the camo shotgun. That was his favorite. He said the family had a lot of guns. And while at the kennels, did they leave guns? And he said mainly during hunting season or sometimes on golf carts and trucks. And then they asked, were the car doors locked? Nope. Keys were in them. <laughs> this guy was awesome. Then they talk about Alec carrying a pistol in his car and he said he knew that because one time he had to drive Alec his car to the law firm. They play the kennel video. He identifies all three voices. And he said in the four years he's been there, he hasn't seen any guns left in the feed room. And so the beds um, in that last video were on top of the kennels. Yeah, I don't think it's out of the question that maybe Paul had to clean up a mess in one of those kennels. I don't know. Um, but it sounds like, you know, the, the hose pipe wasn't the way he, he left it rolled up. So on cross, Jim Griffin's up. You never said you saw guns in the feed room, but this um, on golf carts and things like that. And he said, yes, he talks about there's no season for hog hunting, right? The, I, I don't, I'm gonna have to look up what kind of damage hogs can do to property. Apparently it's pretty bad, uh, but they talk about Paul getting rid of a blue tick dog that I guess was one of his hog hunting dogs, but he kept a dog named Armadillo or was it Amarillo? One of those two. <laughs> so then the defense says, you can't use guns for hogs. And he's like, yep, unless you're man enough to go grab them by the foot. Everybody busted out laughing. They ident He identifies um, Cash, the, the, the brown dog in that last video Paul took in the kennels. They stop the video, though. And on the top left, he sees that hose. And it's not, it's not rolled up. And there's water on the ground. So before the video, someone was with that hose. Paul wasn't particular about how the hose was wrapped. Um, he said Alec was somewhat. And water doesn't usually accumulate around Grady and Bubba. And so he names where the puddles would be. And uh, he's asked if there would have been a puddle at the feed room door. So something there would rot if you left it near the feed room door. And, and so, you know, again, Paul's not as meticulous as you. Nope. So they talk about, he talks about when the kennels are wet the sun in the afternoon hits and it doesn't take long for it to dry. But the defense points out, you know, um, no sun to dry that water out. He wasn't as meticulous as you. So you would have been sure that puddle didn't stay essentially. And they talk about lovey dovey and that's how he described Alec and Maggie. And he said they loved each other. They, he said he's never seen Alec raise his voice at her and anything the kids wanted, they got. They talk about Paul and Alec uh, like to hunt and fish and drink beer together. He said Buster wasn't there as much, but was always friendly to him. And they talk about one hunting dog that was in the kennel and he tried to get out and it choked him and he was hurt really bad. And so they decided the humane thing would be to put the dog down. And so the defense points out Alec couldn't do it. And he asked you, did you? And he said, yes. So on the day of the murders, you left at 4.30, went straight home, stayed home. Did you hear any gunshots? No. He mentioned that Paul liked a hog hunt with that blackout before the murders. When was the last time you saw it? He said it was at least five to, five to six months before the murders that he last saw that blackout. He asked what was in the feed room. He talks about shock collars for the dogs, GPS collars, dog medications, dog food, chicken feed, that kind of thing. And he said Maggie would drive her car or bike or ride the golf cart down to the kennels usually. Sometimes she would walk. And then they tell the story about uh, Alec got a rooster who just ticked off the dogs. I think the, the rooster was like strutting and yelling at the dogs. And so 
that's when the dog started chasing chickens was after the rooster. So on redirect, what happened to the rooster? So a dog got him. Poor little, poor little thing. He's asked, did Alec hunt a lot? And he said, I, I don't know how much. And the prosecution says, but, you know, he did hunt. That's killing animals. But it's a little different when it's a dog, and like a family dog. Man, I, I said this on the Q&A today. If you ever watch Where the Red Fern Grows or like Old Yeller, man, those things haunt me. It's just like they, they had this lasting impact. Yeah. So, but what the defense is saying essentially is Alec couldn't even shoot a dog. You think he's going to shoot his son and his wife. That's, that's where they were going. He talks about the, the prosecutor talks about it being fairly well lit in there. Yes. At bedtime, they ask him, what's your bedtime? He's like four to five. I get home, get the shower, get in the recliner for the rest of the day. And, um, he said there were no guns by the way, in the kennel the day of the murders. The next witness was financial Carson Burney. He is a forensic accountant to the state grand jury division. He kind of just looked into where that $792,000 had gone. I'm not going to go through a bunch of financials. We've covered so much financial stuff. We know he's stolen from a lot of people, but that first deposit was made on March 10th of 2021 for 192,000 and then 375,000. Then April 20th, there was the 225000 from April 20th. All that $792,000 is gone by May 25th of 2021. So they talk about where it's spread out. Um, he had paid some of his partners and also um, some credit card fees. And that was all this other stuff. Just financials, y'all, I get it, but dead horse. So the next witness, this was a surprise. Miriam Proctor, who is Maggie's, can I just say, beautiful, gorgeous sister. They were the only two. Um, so Maggie was her only sibling. They grew up in Wilmington with their parents, and they both ended up in South Carolina for college, met their spouses, and, and stayed here. So she lives in Charleston, and they're five years apart. So the age difference, they weren't super close growing up, but as they got to be adults, started having kids, they, they did more together. And so she said, now that they were empty nesters, they were really having a good time. Um, she said Maggie was sweet. She was a free spirit, always up for anything, and loved her boys. They were her world. Buster was really emotional. You could tell he was holding it back. His face was super red. She said Maggie was definitely a girly girl, but she made the best of having two boys. She would hunt and fish, and she said Maggie would get in a deer stand with a magazine and the boys would fuss at her because turning the pages would make too much noise. But she was just pointing out how this girly girl was a boy mom and jumped in head first and did what they liked. She said Maggie was a big Gamecock fan. Sister's a big Clemson fan. Go Tigers. She said her daughters loved Aunt Maggie and it gave her the chance to do girly stuff that she didn't get to do having two boys. She said Paul was a sweet, sweet boy. Um, she said he was misrepresented in the media. He was kind, always wanted to help, called him a kind soul. And she said, I loved him a lot. She said Maggie was not involved with the family finances. Maggie was happy. And she said they had a comfortable life. It wasn't this lavish life, but money wasn't an issue. She talks about Alex's parents, Randolph and Miss Libby. She knew them both. And towards the time of the murder, she re reiterates what we know, which is um, Miss Libby's Alzheimer's was declining and it had been for a few years and as we know unfortunately miss libby is is total care right now she asked about randolph's health and she kind of goes over it you know that it, it, it was declining and then they talk about the properties that alec and maggie had she talks about the house they built in hampton the edisto house which she couldn't really remember how long they'd had it but she thought around 15 years i know the guy that approached me last week said he had been neighbors for about 10 of those and Moselle was the most recent purchase. That was the hunting place. Uh, great setup for hunting, she said. And plenty of room for Alec and the boys' friends to all come crash. And it was not Maggie's favorite place. We know that, too. She loved Edisto. So they talk about the boat crash. And after the boat crash, Maggie kind of felt the community backlash against the family. And she said it was devastating for them. And she said it was an accident and Maggie felt the Hampton community just turned against her and Paul and that Paul would get harassed. And it was hard and stressful for the whole family. And she said, that's part of the reason she thinks Maggie stayed in Edisto around this time. 
And she said, also, Maggie started looking for a new place near, near Hilton Head or Bluffton. And she found a house that she absolutely loved. She called her sister and her parents to come see it. Alec was also there, but they didn't make an offer in the end, ultimately, because Alec said it was a bad time with the boat case going on. The day of the murders, Maggie called. Uh, she was at Edisto. She had some workers at the house who was getting the house, I guess, kind of summer ready. Mr. Randolph was sick, and Alex had Alec had told her he needed her to come home and that Paul was there, too. So, man, her sister gets so emotional, and she hardly got this out. She said, I told her to go, encouraged her to go. The prosecutor said, you encouraged her to go, and she breaks down, and she said, I did. So the last time they talked was that day of the murders around 4 p.m., and she said Maggie liked to call when she was driving. And that evening, she was watching a movie with her husband. Randy texted her and said, there's been a tragedy. Have Bart. Call me. Bart is her husband. And so Bart went outside and called. Randy tells him, you know, Maggie and Paul have been shot, and then and they're dead. So on the stand, she's crying and she said, you know, th th this has to be a mistake. So they get their things and they feel like they need to go tell uh, their parents in person in Somerville. She said her mom had just had a knee replacement at this time, too. She called her parents and said, you know, we're going to come over. We've got some bad news. We want to tell you in person. And she said her mom was just in shock and kept making noises. And look, as a mom of three, I, I, I can't even begin to. I don't even want to think about what I would do if I got that kind of news about my child or my grandchild. I don't have them yet, maybe in 20 years, but still, it just, I can't imagine being a mom or dad losing your child. It's just anyway. So the next day they went to Moselle and for the next few days they had, you know, family coming in from Kentucky, but uh, they were at Moselle for the most part daily planning the funerals, that kind of thing. And, when asked, did that shock last a while? She said, it's still hard to face. And so at Moselle, they saw Alec. They hugged and cried. After a few days, she said, you know, Alec was just torn up. People would come to see him. And she asked if Maggie had suffered. And Alec assured her that she did not. And neither did Paul. Later, she asked, do you have any idea who did this? And Alec said, I don't know. But whoever it was thought about it a really long time. She said she didn't know what that meant. Alec told them that he had dinner and took a nap. And she said that was routine. He would have dinner, lay down, take a nap on the couch and never said he went out to the kennels. Then she's asked the last conversation with Maggie. She talked about coming in specifically to go to see the parents. Don't you think it's odd she didn't go? And because that's why she went that night. And, you know, she just really didn't know. But um, in the weeks following the murder, Alec said about the boat case that, he was intent on clearing Paul's name. And he said it was his number one goal to clear Paul's name. And she said, my number one goal and concern was finding out who killed Maggie and Paul. She said they were just terrified for Alec and Buster both. But Alec really didn't seem to be afraid. She, he, she thought they needed protection like bodyguards or something. And then Alec talked about getting Buster back into law school after the murders. So, then she reiterated that sometimes Maggie would ride her bike to the kennels, the golf cart, the car maybe. And Maggie seemed to be okay with the boys having guns. And her sister said, you know, why would you get them those guns? And Maggie said, you know, they like to shoot hogs. So she didn't question it. And so on cross, they talk about Mary, be, uh, uh, Mary, Maggie being a very special person and talked about her and Alec had a special relationship and the family did stuff together. And she said, yes, by the way, this uh, is the sister that has the house and the keys where Alec went. And I think it was like the next month after the murders, they talk about how Paul's friends referred to her parents as Papa T and, and like, I think it was grandma P and that Buster's friends were part of your family too. And she said, yes, uh, just sounds like, you know, kind of like my family, my grandparents are my friend's grandparent, or I have one grandparent left, but you know, my, my, Pop and my Grammy have been Pop and Grammy to my friends. So it's very familiar. And they would vacation and get together. They were just close to the whole family. Alec was with Maggie at every sporting event. And she said, yeah, Alec would be coaching. So in the weeks leading up to the murders, you had a family get together, which was a baby shower for her daughter up in Greenville, where I live. 
And she said that was actually the weekend before Memorial Day weekend. Remember, we have the video of Memorial Day weekend where we see Chris Wilson in the background, hug Alec Paul's carrying the cake, smiling big, proud. This is dad's birthday. It's so weird to watch that stuff now, knowing what we know. And so they show a photo um, from that baby shower weekend of Alec, Maggie, Paul, and Buster together. It just looks like a normal family picture, y'all. Jim Griffin asked, did you see Maggie after Greenville? And she said, no, that was... Um, that was the last time because the Murdochs were at Edisto for Memorial Day weekend. She was back in Greenville. Uh, it was her birthday, the sister. And then um, we know that weekend after Alec and Maggie went to USC for the baseball game or for that tournament. So the defense says Maggie did a lot for Alec's parents, but didn't make her sad to go over there. And she said she went a lot, but not every day like Alec. And, you know, I understand it could be very sad when you're experiencing somebody in advanced Alzheimer's. It's uh, they don't know who you are sometimes or most of the time. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's, I know some people who have a very hard time visiting family with Alzheimer's, not, not because they don't love them, but it's just hard on the heart. You know, I don't know. I mean, we've never had anybody in our family with Alzheimer's, but I've dealt with it being a caregiver and it is, it is hard to do. And it's very sad in a lot of ways. So they mentioned that Randolph, could not have salt in his food. Sometimes Maggie would try to bring him things or cook things, I guess, that would make him happy. Uh, he was not happy about a no salt diet, apparently. And so he talks about, you said it was odd she didn't go to the house, but at that point, Mr. Randolph was back in the hospital. He said, it doesn't seem odd anymore, does it? And she's like, I don't know. So after the call from Randy about the murders, you went to tell your parents in person. And the next day, they went to Moselle with her parents. So she said Maggie enjoyed Edisto over Moselle. The reason Alex stayed at Moselle mainly was because his work was in Hampton and it was closer. And so the defense mentions that Alec wanted Maggie to come stay at Moselle more. And she said Alec didn't like to be alone. She didn't think him asking her to come back that night was unusual. They talked about Paul being there. She knew Paul was going to be there. And then he reiterates, he encouraged her to go. And she said, yes. So. They talk about after the murders, three days later, Randolph passes away. A day or two after the murders, Alec and Buster came to Somerville, which is where Maggie's parents lived to stay, and they stayed a lot. And so the defense points out he never stayed another night at Moselle after the murders, and he came to Key West and then uh, also came to Greenville, and Alec stayed with Randy, and he she just said he was all over the place after the murders. And they talk about her statement that he was intent on clearing Paul's name, and um, she said, yeah, Maggie also felt that Paul wasn't driving the boat. She was adamant and on a mission, according to Jim Griffin. And, and so her sister said, sort of, you know, you're not critical about Alec wanting to clear his name, surely. And she says, I'm not. I just thought his pr priority would be finding these people who just killed Maggie and Paul. And he says, how do you know that wasn't his priority? And she said, well, he never talked about it. We thought it had to do with the boat case and thought that that up really until September when things started to change a bit. And then he mentions, did you know Alec carried a gun? And she said, he always had a gun. And so the defense says on his person. And she said, I, I know he did in his car. Then they talk about Bubba being a handful. Yes. Um, Maggie enjoyed going to the kennels. Yes. She was a dog lover. There was no dogs in the house at Moselle because of the allergy, but there were dog beds all over the porch and huge buckets of water. And so also they asked, did Maggie and Alec let the dogs in at Edisto? And she said, I don't think so. She had a dog pen kind of under the house or something for them there. She also said that Maggie loved having the boys friends over. And the defense says Moselle was Paul's passion and Alec loved being there with him. And she said, yes. So they talk about Alec's relationship with Paul. They asked this to everybody who knew them. Um, she said they loved all the same things. The plan ultimately in the end was for Paul to take over Moselle one day and great father and son team. And, and as far as Alec and Maggie's relationship, she said it was good, but not perfect. But Maggie was happy. So on redirect, when Maggie called and said she had a reason to go to Moselle, um, what what was her reason? And it, it was to see the parents. So something happened in September that made you think differently. He was fired from the law firm. He was still in from his clients is what she said. So on the way to the football game, um, they got the call from a friend in September about 
they send the jury out, right? So the, she doesn't talk about the roadside shooting in front of the jury, by the way. But we get into this back and forth. And so ultimately, Creighton Water says, look, this was raised on cross by the defense. They asked about something changes over time. Well, it would have been, you know, the him getting fired, them finding out that they're stealing, and then the roadside shooting, which you know, at first was reported by Alec to be just a random drive by maybe targeted, but then yeah, cousin Eddie comes in the picture. The prosecution points out September. What happens with Alec temperature rises? Things happen. Things start happening when things start getting heated. So judge Newman asked the prosecution, what exactly was the question? And so waters goes around and doesn't answer it. And so he, he says to the defense, if he won't answer my question, maybe you will. So uh, the defense says she started talking with about the roadside shooting. The prosecutor doesn't remember the exact question. And Judge Newman's like, we have court reporters. They, they kind of proffer her. What changed? Well, the friend called. Sorry to hear about your brother-in-law. They didn't know. Meaning Maggie's sister and her husband didn't know anything about this roadside shooting. And the friend said he's been shot. And she thought it's who killed Maggie and Paul had killed Alec too, and Buster was next. So you can just imagine what's going through her mind. And at some point they talked to Jim Griffin. You know, he said, look, yeah, he's been shot and fired from his law firm because he stole money. They talk about some matters to explore while the jury's out. Um, Judge Newman's like, we're not going to go into it, but just kind of give me the quick version. You know, that Maggie and the family was wrestling with the opioid abuse by Alec and fidelity concerns. Judge Newman's like, you're going to cross-exam her that Alec is living in fear and that he started carrying a gun on his person. And she said, I don't know. And then she mentions September. So they're going back, uh, reading what was read out in court through that rough transcript from the court reporter. And the roadside shooting changed her concern. So Judge Newman said, you know, what concerned you about that? And she said, we were concerned. We felt someone was after them and, and found out other things were going on with his life, like the stealing. And she recalls a conversation that she had with Jim Griffin that day, who's his defense attorney right now. And Jim Griffin said, that's hearsay. I mean, he was serious, y'all, though. It wasn't a joke. And the courtroom just kind of erupts in laughter. And so they talk about the the family issue with the opioids that's been going on from from more than 10 years. And then they get into some woman called Alec or something that he knew from college. And Maggie got mad and called that woman's husband or something. So this was like 15 years ago. And Judd, um, the defense asked if Ma Maggie ever raised an issue about Alec being unfaithful. And Judge Newman said, like, as in 15 years ago. And the witness says that Maggie thought it was an affair, but it was many years ago and they resolved it. But Maggie still brought it up. You know how we are. Like if we're mad about something, something's ticked us off 20 years ago, you might hear about it 20 years later out of the blue because that, that's how we roll. So a year before the murders, it still bothered her. During that time, actually, Maggie made Alec leave the house for a while. That's how mad she was. So Ultimately, Judge Newman talks about she can testify about Alec living in fear, um, can't testify, you know, about the um, about the, the marital issue. And she can testify about him being fired and the drug problem. And she can testify her concerns changed because of a conversation with you talking about Mr. Jim. So the jury's back in and on a redirect what happened in September. She says um, on September 4th. This is in 2021. Mark got a phone call. Sorry to hear about your brother-in-law. Alex been shot. They call Buster. He said he's been shot. He's being airlifted, but hoped he would be okay. And so they called his attorney, Jim Griffin. And he said, Alex been shot in the head and fired for stealing from his law firm. You know, her concern is that Alex dead at this point. This family's being targeted. And that concerned concern changed once she started finding out more about the financial stuff. And she said, you know, we just had no clue. The shooting was an event in itself. The prosecution asked, did other information change, you know, about the shooting? And, and then they talk about this nickname for Paul. And she said that Maggie nicknamed him little detective. Because she felt he was always making sure his dad was behaving and she's referring to prescription pain pills. And so Maggie had expressed concern about 
his pill usage and had she said it had been going on for some time. And so little detective, if there were pills in the house, then Paul would find them. And I guess let Maggie know. When asked what changed about the roadside shooting, she said, um, you know, the story initially they were told by Alec wasn't true. He lied again. So next up is her husband, Mr. Proctor. And they've been married for 37 years. And they've asked if, if he's seen the kennel video. So they play it. He identifies the voices. He identifies Alec. And then on cross, um, you and your wife, were you shown the blue raincoat by sled? Yes, we were. Do you recognize it? No. Did you ever see Paul wear it? No. So apparently there was an issue with a witness for the state. They start talking about some things. Um, this, this roadside shooting is kind of a bridge that like we need to cross. We're there. Anyways, the judge had sent the jury home for the day. He stops and tells them to come back at 1030. We're going to argue this out starting at 930. And, um, you know, the prosecutor said there's a chain of circumstances that start June 7th. With the financial information, Chris, uh, Chris Wilson testified on September 14th or September 4th. He got Alec to meet him. And remember, he confronted him about the $192,000 that he owed him. And then a short time later, boom, roadside shooting. And then they talk about how Maggie's sister, her first reaction is the killer's back. And the prosecution said, which is exactly what Alec wanted. Um, they want to put in a recorded statement. And it's no longer than 30 minutes. And so they talk about Alec had someone shoot him in the head to have insurance pay $10 million to Buster in a payout. And um, so Harputlian is like, yeah, he had a skull fracture, a brain bleed. He was airlifted to Savannah. He's been through detox. And Alec admits it, saying he didn't want to waste resources. So they call SLED and put Alec on the phone with SLED, where he admits that um, Eddie Smith, his who is a drug dealer, was in on this. And the prosecutor said in the wake of the side of the road shooting, he said it was an unknown individual. In fact, an artist drew a composite sketch. You know, him saying he's been targeted, it was all a lie. So <laughs> Harputlian said the issue here is Mr. Murdoch lies. And people in the courtroom start laughing. And, and months after the murders, you know, he's talking about the roadside shooting. He says he didn't do it for sympathy. He did it to help out Buster. And then he makes a comment about Eddie not being able to kill him from four feet away. And but essentially the defense is saying this roadside shooting had nothing to do with the murders. The prosecutor kind of makes a funny if, if Harputlian stip stipulates in front of the jury that his client's a liar. You know, the focus is how Alec tried to use it and what he said about the roadside shooting. He was trying to get sympathy. So, um, and then Harputlian said he wanted to be dead. Um, and then how is this rel relevant to June 7th? And so Smith is on the witness list. He said they're not necessarily going to call him. But man, maybe this opened a can of worms. We'll see. That was kind of it for today. It was, you know... It was nice to see a voice for Maggie in the courtroom that actually was on the witness stand. Now, I know Buster's on the defense list. Um, I think Randy's on the prosecution list. Maybe John Marvin's on the defense list. I don't know who's going to testify, if any of them will. Um, but, you know, the big rumor still, maybe he's going to take the, the stand in his own defense. It's a gamble, but maybe one they have to take because there's a lot of discrepancies in what we've seen in court as to what he has said happened that night and where he was and all that stuff. So um, who knows if they're going to finish up tomorrow. It seems like maybe now we are we going to bring Eddie Smith in? Who knows? I don't know. But uh, the jury doesn't come in until 1030. So, yeah, man, this has been over an hour. And, I, you know, I feel like I need to just take the time to type out my notes because sometimes I, it looks good in court what I wrote down and then I get here and I'm, I'm – it's like my hand had a seizure or something because that I cannot read that. So maybe tomorrow it might be a little later, but I'm, I think I'm going to have to start typing these back out because I try to write fast. I average about 24 pages a day of notes. So if you see me on the feed, usually my head's down because I'm writing. But anyways, all right, guys, that's it. That's all. We'll see what happens tomorrow with these rulings, and then we'll see who's going to be some of the very last witnesses for the state called. And also, does anybody have COVID on that jury? Please know everybody stay healthy and we will see you tomorrow with a full recap of tomorrow's testimony. See you then. <laughs>